to the introductory webinar on motorcycle taxis in the rural context in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. This is a Research for Community Access Partnership event sponsored by UK Aid, and we're delighted to be joined by so many researchers, practitioners, NGO and private sector colleagues today. We're also joined by four link-up hubs in Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia and Kenya, who are all dialing in groups today. A very warm welcome to you all. My name is Caroline Barber and I'll be moderating today's session. Now is the perfect time to be discussing motorcycles and motorcycle taxis. Motorcycles, or boda boda as they are regularly called in many East African countries, often operate where more conventional services are economic or where simply physical access is difficult. They are found in both rural and urban areas. Motorcycles and three-wheelers are becoming one of the main means of transporting both people and goods and are attracting an increasingly varied user population. They provide an important means of transport for reaching health services, markets and schools. However, according to the WHO's latest report on powered two and three wheelers, they also account for more than 286,000 deaths around the world each year. This is about 23% of all road traffic deaths. There is a clear need for effective planning for motorcycle safety and this requires a comprehensive understanding of the risk factors involved and potential solutions in different settings. It is important to develop these solutions in a way that appreciates the transformational role that motorcycles have in opening up rural access, rather than simply closing it down. Today's webinar will start to unpack some of these key issues. I'm delighted to be joined today by three expert speakers. Mr. Leo Ngoi from Sumatra in Tanzania, Mr. Felix Wilhelm Siebert from the Technical University of Berlin, who will share results from research in Myanmar, and finally, Dr. Elizabeth Caraccio from Makerere University in Uganda. After their presentations, there will be a short moderated session, and then you will be able to ask your questions. You can ask questions at that point by using the raise your hand function or you can post in the chat box. Feel free to post questions in the chat box as we go, and we will try to respond to as many as we can at the end. If you have any technical difficulties today, my colleagues will try to assist you. Please kindly send a message through the chat box. We will be live tweeting today using hashtag motorcycle taxis. That's hashtag motorcycle taxis. We'll look out for your tweets and we will be retweeting. So now I have the great pleasure to hand you over this morning to our first speaker, Leo Ngoi, broadcasting live from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania this morning. Over to you, Leo. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Leo Ngoi. I'm talking from Tanzania. I work with the Surface and Marine Transport Regulatory Authority. I'm the licensing manager for road transport. I'd like to give you a brief uh, uh, background of the how the uh, uh, regulator, uh, the border border started in Tanzania. And my presentation will be in four parts. We'll see the overview of the motor taxis in Tanzania, the initiative that has been taken by the Sumatra, and what is to be done in Tanzania and the advisors to the other countries. Uh, generally, uh, the border border in Tanzania started uh, in 2009. The member of the parliament are the ones who passed that law to ensure that the border borders are being allowed to transport passengers in the country. Before that, the border border were just used by the uh, private people. And in 2010, the Surface and Marine Transport Regulatory Authority has, has the mandate to ensure that the sector is being regulated. We did prepare the regulations to ensure that the border border or the uh, uh, these tricycles and motorcycles are well uh, regulated. Uh, since then, 
since the member of the parliament authorized the use of the border border, a number of people try to purchase this border border and engage the business without get any training or any uh, the government started to regulate the, the, the industry. So um, um, you find um, during that time, 2011, a number of border border increased tremendously from the uh, from the market. Next slide, please. You find, yeah, uh, you find that in 2011, uh, the number of border border in the country increased almost the rate of 2,000 in the in the market. Given that opportunity of to provide the transport services by using the uh, border border, you find that the business people or the drivers can get themselves to drive their motorcycles without having the knowledge on how what to drive, without having the skills to uh, to to take note on the road safety issues. As a result the number of deaths, the number of road access in the country increased. And you find that these people who engage into this business, especially in the restaurant area, are quite untrained. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, as you see, the, this uh, Boda Boda the member of the parliament, when they issued the authority for the for the use of the border border, it's very flexible. It can be used in the rural areas and the areas that uh, the uh, where the mode of transport is the means of transport is difficult. Now, given that, um, you find the community, the number of people who engage this business, they get a, a job. But as a result, uh, the number of uh, this youth who engage this business, since they lack skills, they enter into the crashes. Um, and if you look at the Mohimili uh, National Hospital, we have the ward that's called Boda Boda Ward, uh, and the number of people that were injured. In fact, the, the, it's true that the border border gave the uh, internationalized the, the revolutionized the, the transport industry, but the impact of the border border were quite high because of the road access. Next slide. Um, given the mandate that we have in the regulations that we prepared, we prohibit some of the, uh, the, the habits that were practiced by the, the, the drivers, as you can see the pictures, you find that there is a lot of overloading, and the number of the passengers that are picked by the border borders are not uh, authorized. So, next slide. Next. So, given that opportunity, the Sumatra, with the help of the applicants, we managed to develop the training curriculum, whereby we started uh, we started picking out what was there on the ground to ensure that the curriculum take into account in the number of issues to to alleviate the situation. Africa uh, helped us to develop this curriculum in 2015. And in 2016, the curriculum was launched officially, and the authority, with some other stakeholders, uh, 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 translated the curriculum into Swahili, whereby uh, the, the training schools can train the uh, people with the language that is only that. Now we have the curriculum in place, it's there with the uh, traffic police. And we have handed over the curriculum, the number of schools to train the border border that uh, can use the curriculum to ensure that 
the training is okay. Next slide. Um, the curriculum uh, held us to the expected uh, outcome of the curriculum is competence-based, whereby it imparts the knowledge to the border border drivers to know how to drive safely, how to use road signs, and how to, to, to behave on road. And we, we also train these border border drivers to know the better customer care, how they can handle their customers so that the road accidents and some other and ethical practices are not uh, 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 emanated in the community. Next slide. Uh, apart from that initiative from the Sumatra of developing the curriculum, the authority also thought we have to engage these border border associations by ensuring that at least we develop the place where they can meet. And therefore, we decided to embark on the construction of the 10 uh, parking sheds uh, among the big regions in the country. And the intention of this is whereby the association, the big associations, they met, they keep stock of their members, and at least they disseminate some other information to their member group. That the other initiative that the, the Sumatra we have taken. Again, we have seen the regulations that they developed in 2010. They have some issues that they need to be reviewed, and therefore, currently, we are making the review of the past regulations so that we can uh, include some other needs that we have seen that uh, it's very important so that the community can be safe. The other initiative that we have. We have the wearing helmet campaign. As you can see the picture, the driver and the, uh, those uh, passengers don't wear helmet. Therefore, we have the campaign to change the culture of the passengers and how do the passenger or the drivers use helmet. So the, the helmet campaign is on move right now. Next. Um, generally, I can say that uh, we have to give some advice to the countries that they have not used the border border, like Zambia. Um, what I can say, border border sometimes can be an inevitable need because it's a push from the market, it's a push from the community. And given the chance that uh, there's some really gap in the transportation, Therefore, uh, the cars that have not embarked on the border border, uh, they have to get it prepared, uh, say they can uh, make the regulations before, and try to talk to their, uh, whoever who is possible to prepare the curriculum for the training so that they can get it prepared when this uh, 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 push comes from the community, then they can know where to start. Again, they can make the consultation with the public to know whether really they need to embark on the border borders or not. Because the impact that has been seen from the border border sometimes are very high in the community. So they have to take caution on that. And again, uh, they have to think on the mitigation measures before they get the embark on that. Some of the mitigation measures that they can use in the different uh, uh, campaigns and create awareness in the community. So uh, what is what I can share from this end in Tanzania. Otherwise, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Leo, for that fascinating presentation. And may I say how refreshing to hear a regulator working in such a collaborative way to find win-win solutions. I'll now hand over to Felix, who will share his research and talk specifically about helmet use in Myanmar. Over to you, Felix. Thank you very much, Caroline, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Recap and Transaid, for 
for inviting me to this webinar to talk about our research on helmet use in Myanmar. Um, thank you very much, Leo, for your first presentation. It was really interesting. Lots of the challenge you, challenges you face in Tanzania are also challenges in Myanmar. Next slide, please. So what you see here is the number of registered passenger cars and motorcycles in Myanmar in the years from 2004 to 2014. And you can see that the number of passenger cars stays quite constant at around half a million, but the number of motorcycles increases rapidly. And with it, the motorcycle traffic, of course, increases in the country. Mind you, though, that Myanmar has around 50 million um, people living in the country, and the motorization is still quite low with around 10%. So this trend will not stop in the near future. Next slide, please. What you can see here is a number of the WHO Global Status Report on Road Safety, and in the zoomed in parts on the bottom right corner, you can see that the number of deaths um, resulting from road safety accidents has more than doubled from 2004 and 2013. So this is related to the high increase in number of registered motorcycles in the country. In the upper right corner, you can see that the helmet wearing rate in the country is generally quite low at around 50% of all riders. So this combines passengers and drivers. Next slide, please. Myanmar is quite a big country. You can see it on the left, uh, borders on India, China, Laos, and Thailand. Um, but the Global Status Report does not give any indication for helmet use in different regions, although the, quant uh, the country is quite big. It also does not give uh, single values of helmet use for drivers and passengers, because we have seen in other countries that drivers wear helmets more often than passengers on motorcycles. And what might be most important for this webinar today, the Global Status Report does not indicate differences in helmet use between rural and urban villages. So we, as a team of researchers, wanted to collect more detailed data on helmet use of Myanmar motorcycle drivers. But we were only a small team, so we had to find a way, a way to still make it work. Next slide, please. We choose to do a video-based observation study. So there are generally two ways you can do helmet use observation. You can stand next to the street and count the helmets by hand, or you can film traffic and then code the videos afterwards. We choose a video-based observation study for several reasons. First reason, it's inexpensive equipment. So the camera you see on the left side um, is costs around 60 to 70 dollars, and it can film. 12 to 14 hours. And the coding of the helmet use and other variables can be done afterwards. You, so you can film um, all day, record traffic, and while you're recording, you can also do a questionnaire survey, for example. Also, you can slow down a video. So in rush hour, it's quite hard to code all motorcycle, uh, motorcycle riders and um, um, because there are so many. So when you record a video, you can just slow it down, or you can do repeated coding when you have many variables that you want to code. So in our study, we did uh, code lots of variables. I'm just going to present some here today. So we coded helmet use, the position on the motorcycle, where a uh, passenger sits, for example, or um, uh, how many passengers there are. Um, we also coded the time of day, and we compared rural versus urban observation sites. So we always had two cameras wherever we went, and we placed one camera within the city limits and another camera outside of the city limits. Next slide, please. So these are now our results of more than 120,000 motorcycle riders coded. What you see in the upper half of the slide is the position on the motorcycle and the helmet use for these positions. So you can see it in the upper left corner. You have the driver, then you have the passenger number one, passenger number two, passenger number three behind the driver. Then you have passenger zero. This was always children standing on the floorboard of the motorcycle between the driver and the front of the motorcycle. So you see that helmet use drops off rapidly for every additional passenger that is on the motorcycle. So the driver wears the helmet more most often. Um, and then the first passenger only wears a helmet in 50% of our observations. 
Um, a critical value here is the passenger zero value, that's the children. Um, it, the children only wear a helmet on 11% of our observations when they are at this position. In the lower half of the slides, you can see why it's important to not have one value of helmet use for a country. These are the different observation sites we had throughout the country. And you can see that helmet use differs widely between these different observation sites. So you have helmet use of 75% in one place and then helmet use of 31% in another place. Next slide, please. So in the upper half of this slide, you can see our comparison of the places where we compared rural and urban helmet use. So camera within city limits and then camera outside of city limits. And you can see a stark difference. So in rural areas, helmet use in Myanmar is quite low with only 32%. In urban areas within city limits, it's quite high with 60%. In the lower half of the slide, you can see that even time of day influences the helmet use. So here, the helmet use from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. is plotted. And you can see that if you set the helmet use at 6 a.m. as the zero helmet use, and then you just plot the change in helmet use throughout the day, you can see that helmet use rises up quite a lot until 10 a.m., then levels off, and then decreases again in the late afternoon. Since this is an observational study, we're not quite sure what causes this. So it might be that police is only enforcing helmet use during the day, might also be people from rural areas driving into more urban areas and leaving again in the late afternoon. Next slide, please. So if you now find these results interesting and you want to know, you want to do a study like this to get detailed helmet use data for your country, it is quite easy. You just need three things. So first, of course, you need a camera to record traffic. We build our camera ourselves. Um, from computer parts from the Raspberry Pi Zero. It's a mini computer, Raspberry Pi camera module. We use a power bank. It's usually used to charge mobile phones. And then just a gray plastic case that made the uh, camera waterproof. Um, you can build this for 60 to $70. We use the freeware coding software called Bobus. Um, I'll show you a screenshot in a, in a bit. And what you need most is time. So you need lots of time for coding motorcycle behavior, especially if you have lots of motorcycle traffic at your observation sites. Due to this, we only coded 15 minutes of every hour. So the first 15 minutes of every hour, we coded helmet use, and then the next 45 minutes, we didn't code. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a very short video of uh, one of the recording. I choose it because you can also observe different behavior like the um, motorcycle driver here in the front opening up his umbrella, but also to show you the level of detail you have in these videos. So you can not only code helmet use, but also interactions between motorcycle drivers and pedestrians or other cars. And here, this is also a screenshot of the program we use. So on the right side, you can see how the coding is done. There's a timestamp and then the um, code you just put in. So this video-based observation of motorcycle behavior and helmet use is a good way to get detailed helmet use data of a country, even when you have a small team and limited resources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felix. Great to hear about this work that your partners, um, that you and your partners in Myanmar have been undertaking. And um, just to let everybody know that a fact sheet will be available on the Translate website for anyone who wishes to know more. Thanks for the comments and questions that are already flying in for our first two speakers. We're taking note of them. We'll try and respond to as many as we can. As I mentioned in my introduction, um, motorcycle taxis offer a very convenient service and are often more available and affordable than other types of transport. So I'll now hand over to Elizabeth to tell us more about how motorcycle taxis um, can play a role in reducing maternal mortality in Uganda. Thank you, and over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Caro. A very warm welcome to everyone from Uganda. Um, I'll be sharing with you how we have worked with Boda Boda riders to improve access to transport services. Next slide. And I'll share with you um, our experiences from three different projects that we have done. And I'll just give you a brief introduction, um, share some of the challenges and lessons, and look at implications of our work.
Next slide. Uganda faces similar challenges to other developing countries in terms of ensuring access to transport. And so it's often difficult for women to reach service points in time because of transport difficulties. Sometimes availability of the transport is a problem. Sometimes it's the road. In other cases, they are not able to afford to pay the transport costs. And so this leads to delays in receiving appropriate care. Next slide. So in this presentation, I'll be looking at how we engaged with the communities and transporters in providing transport services across three different projects and also sharing the lessons that we learned and the implications of our work. Next slide. So the three projects um, had a supply side component where we had training of health workers, support supervision, provision of equipment, uh, service vouchers, but it also had a demand side where we're working with community health workers and transporters. Next slide. So I'll concentrate on explaining the transport initiatives. In the first program, we had transport vouchers. That was the safe delivery study, and they benefited every pregnant woman. And then in the second program, um, we decided to give the vouchers only to women who live five kilometers away. And so we targeted by distance. And then in the last one, we did not give any vouchers, but we decided to work with locally existing financial networks. These are small groups where people meet to collect money, maybe for meeting funeral expenses or money for Christmas period or for school fees. And so we sensitized these groups about the importance of preparing for birth and the importance of saving for their transport costs. And so they would save with these groups and then they would make arrangements with the Boda Boda riders to take them to the facility. We felt it was important to sensitize the community about these initiatives. So we used a combination of methods in the programs using community health workers, radios, and um, also community meetings. To sensitize the transporters, we generally had uh, small meetings with the transporters. The project in the first case was entirely managed by the project. And then in the second case, we had some community involvement in management. And then in the last program manifest, it was entirely managed by the community. The transporters for the voucher projects were paid by the project, while in the last um, program, they were paid by the community members themselves. Last, next slide. So in terms of engaging with the transporters, as I said, we used to meet them through stage managers. This would be a leader for a small transport group. They did not have um, large organized associations that we could meet them through. We made MOUs and agreements with the transport providers and the health facilities, and this spelled out the expectations that were expected by both parties and helped to hold them responsible. We also ensured that there was a means of giving feedback back to the transporters. Next slide. I'll just uh, run through a few of the results. In the first study, that is the safe delivery study where we had the vouchers, we interviewed women who gave birth during the project period and we asked them whether it was a lot easier for them to get transport during the delivery that they had while they were, the project was on or during their previous delivery. And you can note from the first set of bars that a lot of them said it was a lot easier during the project period. Next slide. We asked them why they said that um, transport services were more available during the project period. And again, as you can see from the third set of bars, the majority of them attributed this to project transport. Next slide. We also asked them about um, the affordability of maternal health services. And again, you can see from the first bar of graphs, the majority of them said it was a lot cheaper during the project period. Next slide. And when we asked them the reason why they said the services was more available, again, you can see that um, a good proportion attributed this to project transport. Next slide. 
in the Manus study, that is where we gave vouchers only to women who were living five kilometers away. And so the women were given those pink referral forms, which they took to the facility, and they got a voucher which they gave the transporter, and after he transported them, he was paid. So we found that 36% of the women received and used the vouchers. When we asked for reasons why they did not, um, the highest percentage said the phone of the transporter was off, and others said um, labor progressed fast. But we felt that these two reasons highlight the fact that availability of transporters in that area where we were doing the project was still a problem. And so it was not very easy for the women to access them. Next slide. We faced um, several challenges and I'll just share a few. We found that it was easier to engage the transporters when the financial benefits for them were high. When they were not benefiting so much financially, they were not very interested. Um, like I just said, some villagers had few transporters and so getting adequate numbers was a problem. Then we had to uh, keep negotiating and changing the payment rates. There was a period when our fuel prices kept increasing and so we were constantly negotiating the transport payment rates. Issues of fraud were also a problem earlier on in the voucher project. We also desired to have um, a database so that we can do some deeper analysis, but it was difficult to develop this database. Next slide. We also um, found that poor record keeping was a problem in some of the facilities, and so it was difficult to verify payment. Then in the last project where we wanted the community to pay for the transport services, initially, they uh, were not very willing because people generally had a poor saving culture, poverty was a problem, and then there was also heavy dependence on government and a feeling that government should meet their transport costs. But initially, um, their attitude began to change. Sustainability was a problem with the voucher projects because they were donor funded and externally managed. And lastly, we found that in some cases, a boda boda is not the most comfortable means of transport or it's not as fast as it needs to be if you have a woman who needs emergency care. And so we needed to link um, the boda bodas with motorized ambulances, but the ambulances were not always available. Next slide. So in terms of looking at the lessons that we learned, we found that the transporters are very active mobilizers and can be useful advocates for maternal health. Um, some of them would even remind the women of their appointment dates. We found that it was easy to engage them if they were benefiting and that to uh, improve their mobilization, they needed to have organized leadership. We also noted that prompt payment is very important to them and that in the absence of that, and they needed regular communication about such issues. We also noted that it's important to review payment rates if the local conditions change and that multiple payment methods are often required. For the second study, we had to use mobile money payment, but also payment in cash. Next slide. We found that for the community, it's important to create awareness about the different transport arrangements that are in place. And so this needs to be planned. And it's important to build trust between the implementer and the transporters so that the program can run smoothly, but also between the transporters and the communities, because the communities preferred to use transporters whom they trust. And so that if a woman is being transported in the middle of the night, she doesn't have to worry about being raped or anything like that. Also found that social networks are important for providing support for mothers to enable them access transport easily. Next slide. Um, as I draw to a close on to share some of the implications of our work, we felt that if uh, you have a transport system and the communities to use it um, actively, they need to benefit from the services that they're trying to seek using the transport system. So in our case, the health facilities needed to provide services that met the expectations of the community. And so we had to engage um, the health providers as well. 
We also found that um, well, another implication is that the community needs to be sensitized about their role in contributing towards transport costs and also in ensuring that Boda Boda transport is safe. So um, if the Boda Boda riders are not using helmets or if they're not obeying traffic regulations, um, their clients need to be able to remind them about the need for them to do that. And then um, sometimes vulnerable populations are not able to benefit from transport that is offered by Boda Boda men. So there is also a need to sensitize the Boda Boda men about their social responsibility so that they do not only think about the profit that they can get, but they can also think about helping people in need who may not uh, be able to pay or who may not have cash at the time when they need their services. Next slide. As I said earlier, we found that in some cases you needed a faster means of transport and so we needed it's important for us to link the use of Boda Bodas with motorcycle ambulances, but also with motorized vehicles to ensure that the transport um, system is more effective. And all this needs to operate within a functional referral system. So it's important to plan for the transport, but also ensure that there are communication facilities and that the facilities are able to respond and to provide emergency services to the people who are taken there, and even routine services. Um, one unintended consequence that we need to be aware of is the fact that the use of border borders could increase accidents if traffic regulations are not obeyed. Um, in the areas where we did the work, because it was a rural community, we did not have a lot of accidents reported. But in Kampala, um, a lot of the accidents that are in our emergency wards are a result of uh, Boda Bodas. So it's important to make sure that uh, plans are put in place to increase uh, the safety of the Boda Bodas while they're being used. Um, next slide. So in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge and to thank those who funded this work, Comic Relief, DFID, WHO, um, the Future Health Systems Partners, the Macquarie staff, and also the district staff. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for that inspiring presentation. What I found particularly interesting about what you were saying is the working with Boda Boda riders, um, such a traditionally male-oriented um, orientated group, to find solutions to, to tackle maternal mortality rates in Uganda. Um, rather than working in, um, in, a, in a traditional sort of silo, really cross-cutting approach. So thank you for sharing your experiences there. I will now ask each of our moderators a question, um, and this will also include handing over to our hub in Kenya um, to ask them a specific question as well. So first of all, a um, question for Leo. What do you think the role of motorcycle taxi associations can have in improving both rural access as well as safety? And just to note, Leo, because of time, if we can keep the responses um, as concise as possible. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in fact, the uh, association has a bigger role to play for the safety and other uh, regulatory issues. Uh, when you want to make a communication to the association or to this border border operators, it's very difficult to make individuals but through association we can meet the the uh, the, uh, the people the bigger group in a very short time so that's one of the advantage again through association we can give education focus group discussion try to elaborate about the laws and the, uh, some of the um, uh, road safety issues so the association can help that again through association, it's very easy for them to get a loan from the banks and some other these uh, supports, uh, these financial institutions. So through association, we carry that. And again, through association, is a self-regulatory. It's it helps to make a self-regulations since they are joined together. In the association, there are records of their names where they pass and some other issues of the community. So for the passengers, it's easy to identify the drivers, 
as we have embedded in a very systematic approach of issuing the code number to know who's the driver, where he parks, and the behavior. So through the application also, uh, they can monitor the behavior of the drivers. So really, the association has helped uh, the, to, to regulate these border border operators as it's difficult for the authority to regulate individuals. So we encourage association as there is a number of advantages. Yeah. Very much, Leo. Thank you. Um, and a question, Felix, for yourself. Um, is there scope to adapt your methodology to other countries and understand more about motorcycle taxis in rural areas um, and look into things like the causes of crashes? Thank you. Um, thank you. That's a very good question. So the um, methodology of, of the observation study, of the video-based observation study, is very adaptable to other countries. So since you just need the camera that you can build yourself, um, you can do this in any country in the world. But what I want to, um, what I also want to mention is that it's not limited to helmet use, but you can also uh, look at the interaction uh, of traffic participants. So, for example, you can set up a camera at the Boda Boda shade uh, or at a, at a street crossing where pedestrians cross. This is all possible to observe the behavior of uh, road users. But observation studies can only be part of research. So you cannot, you can observe the people from the outside, but you cannot, let's say, look into their mind. So for this, I, I like to couple uh, video-based observation with questionnaire surveys. And I just want to mention here, uh, Paolo Perego from the uh, University of Milan, he developed a Boda Boda questionnaire that goes in this direction um, exactly. So together with him, I want to do observation studies and then also question the people why they don't use a helmet, for example. Because there can be many reasons for why a person does not use a helmet. Perhaps the helmet is too expensive or the person does not believe that the helmet really saves lives or he just doesn't like it because it destroys his hair. So there can be many reasons, but you can only observe this so much, but then you need to question the people why they show this behavior. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, Elizabeth, um, I have two very quick questions for you. The first one is a quick answer. We've had some questions in asking which district specifically in Uganda you are working with. And the second part of the, so if you could answer that one first, and then the second part of the question, um, we've heard how Boda Bodas can improve access to um, services like health. Thank you for that. Um, and um, we just, people are asking how that work could be scaled up. Thank you. Um, thank you, Caroline, for those questions. For the districts, we're working in Palisa, in Kamoli, and in Chiboko. Then, with regard to scaling up, there are about uh, five things that we need to pay attention to. One is increasing availability of the motorcycles. Uh, motorcycles are often, uh, you know, a market-driven kind of commodity that is there for those who want to use them. So, initiatives to promote availability would be good. And then also making sure that we link these motorcycles with motorcycle ambulances or motorized vehicles because if a, if a patient is unconscious or a woman you know is bleeding then just a boda boda is not appropriate you need uh, more advanced um, methods of transportation then uh, paying attention to affordability and inclusion of vulnerable persons so that everyone can be able to use the motorcycle methods such as vouchers have been used but we can also use repayment through these um, financial small networks that exist, but also through insurance schemes. Then safety is another thing that we need to pay attention to, and several um, people have talked about this in regard to traffic laws and helmets, but also just ensuring that people are safe from being uh, robbed uh, by the people transporting them. In Uganda, safety with border borders at night is quite an issue. Then uh, fourthly, recognition of the contribution that they make and institutionalization of these different aspects so that uh, things are done in an orderly and planned manner. And lastly, community involvement. The community needs to be aware 
of their role in terms of planning for transport, planning to contribute for transport, but also in their role in terms of encouraging the riders to use um, the required safety procedures such as helmets and the traffic um, laws and regulations that are in place. So those are some of the things we need to think about as we think of scaling up this to improve health services. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'd have a, a quick question for Felix, if that's okay. Um, we've actually had three people asking sort of similar question. Um, really interested in your, your research and asking, did you look at helmet use um, by, by sex, by gender? Are women less or more likely to use helmets? Um, that's a great question. And um, initially, we did not look at gender differences. Or we just recorded the video. And then afterwards, in the coding, we had so many codes already that we did not look at gender specifically. But then we realized uh, quite late, actually, that gender might play a big role. So we now have started to recode um, the videos that we recorded in Myanmar. And we have just started so far the biggest, uh, one of the biggest cities in Myanmar for Mandalay. We don't see differences in helmet use between the genders, but helmet use in Myanmar um, is generally low, but in Mandalay, it's really high. So the police enforcement might lead to this um, well, might lead to this case that we don't find a difference in helmet use for genders. But we're still coding this, so uh, I'll update the fact sheet once uh, we are done with this. Thanks very much, Felix. Thank you. Okay, um, at this moment, I'd like to take a moment to hand over to our um, Link Up Hub in Kenya. Um, to invite them to share briefly with us how technology and developments such as apps for motorcycle taxis may be changing patterns of use and potentially safety in Kenya. Um, so over to Grace Miria in Nairobi. Over to you, Grace. Hoping the connection will hold. Okay. We seem to be having some problems getting through to Grace. So instead, I will um, Can you hear me now? Oh, Grace, welcome. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Caroline. Welcome to the Kenyan Hub. I'll take you straight to Kevin, who will be giving us a presentation on the Mondo Ride and the application and what they do. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Kelvin. I work with Mondoride, a smart application that uh, connects clients and uh, riders using uh, the phone. Now, uh, in Nairobi, we have uh, we have riders. We have good connectivity of network, so we have riders who have application on the applications on their smartphones, and we link them with the clients who request via the phone. They send a request to the rider. The rider accepts and. Uh, the, the, the ride goes on. Now, there are very many benefits we have for riders working on our platform as well as the clients. For the riders, there is increased earnings because uh, what happens is, uh, what normally happens when they are not using the app, the guys stay at a single place and then um, they wait, they go in line, like the first guy you take a client and then the second guy like that, but what happens when you're using the app a guy is a, a rider is able to access clients even when he's sitting there without waiting necessarily for his colleagues to to do a ride first before he takes the next client. Then uh, the fare is uh, pegged on number of minutes, so the rider has to be very safe, which benefits the clients. The rider has to take time; he doesn't have to go fast, so it's both beneficial to the rider and the clients. We also make sure our riders are trained and they have, we provide them with helmets and uh, power banks to enable them uh, to work well. In addition, we we have noticed that there's an increased number of women and clients who do not use the motorcycles before as a mode of transport due to the safety that we provide since we can monitor every ride as it happens on real time. Then uh, we also have a program, our program also enables our riders 
to make savings since they can do right for a period maybe a week and then um, they get they, they get to have the accumulated amount sent to them. Um, since we also do face a few challenges, since the not all the riders are able to access smartphones, there are certain riders who cannot have platforms that do not have smartphones and therefore they cannot work on our platform. Then there are those riders who do have those smartphones, but they are slow adapters to technology, and they only use them to communicate. They have not yet uh, come to terms to using smart taxi application as a mode of earning or transporting people. Then uh, we also have sometimes connectivity issue with the network. Maybe sometimes it's not stable, which affects the way our rides are done. Then uh, the final and very consistent problem is uh, whenever these riders are out there uh, using the applications, the application like Mondoride requires the use of GPS and uh, the internet, which drains the battery and they do not have uh, an output where they can charge their phones, which tends to destroy their phone batteries maybe at times. So those are some of the challenges that we do face with this application. Yes, Caroline, as you can see in Kenya, we have some great innovations around motorcycle transport system. And according to Safaricom Kenya, there are 67, it has recorded 67% smartphone penetration attributed to a growing middle class. And if you look at the slide there, we are seeing that the motorcycle industry is generating 400 million a day, which is equivalent to $4 million, US, uh, $4 million. The sector directly employs 100,000 people and 14 million Kenyans riders uh, ride border borders daily. I'll go straight to the end of the presentation where I will show some two brothers who came up with an innovation uh, called the Smart Jacket. Caroline, if you could please take me to the end of the presentation, the slide that has, um, yes, there we go. If you look at those jackets, what they have done, they have equipped the jackets with LED lights and the indicators are independent, are an independent source of power that are controlled wirelessly and integrated into the motorcycle's indication system. And basically, the system allows any other, uh, any other motorist to be able to see the rider in front of them, whether they're indicating or whether they are braking. And this is, uh, is vital. It's unlike what they do when they're using the hand sign, which makes the motorist very unstable. And currently, the smart jacket comes in two variations, as you can see, one that uses its own power source and the other that draws power from the motorcycle. That is it for us here in Kenya. Thank you so Over much. To you, Carola. Thank you, Grace. Those two presentations were really interesting and very interesting to see how, um, how technology is coming in. Um, one question for um, the Kenya Hub. Um, what have you seen in terms of um, patterns of um, the customer base that might be changing as a result of apps? Um, and is there anything that you can share with us about that further? Yes, Caroline. Yes, uh, I will answer that question. Um, in terms of using the app, the number of customers who, who, have, who have been using our our application that is Mondoride, we have an increased group who are not using motorcycles before, but they now get a sense of security as the rides are monitored on, on real time. So we can see where they are going, the charges are structured, they get that sort of order using the technology which was not there previously. Superb, and uh, we'll have see I answered the question? Yes, we have, and noted that um, more women are also using Bodder Bodders, which is great. Um, that's really good to, to hear this information. Um, I'd like to now, um, we'll come back to you in, in Kenya, but I'd like to hand over to our hub in Uganda um, now, to Neil Reti um, and the team in Kampala, who have been sending through, I think we've got at least 10 questions in, but Neil, if I can ask you to select one or two to share with the group. Um, when you pose a question, if you could say your name, where you're coming from, 
and if you have a preference for who of our speakers today can respond to the question. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, and, and greetings from Uganda. I'm going to pass over to one member of uh, the audience here who's, who's sent in a, a question. I'll have them personally ask it of you. Um, Richard? Um, Dr. Richard, we can't hear you too well. Um, Neil and the team in Kampala, we could hear you very well, Neil, but if you could put the microphone closer to um, your colleague, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Hello, we can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, the um, the connection doesn't seem to be holding, or there may be a problem with the line. We've got plenty more questions that have come through, so while we're trying to get them back, um, one thing to note, we've had several quest, um, requests for copies. Um, this is for, for Leo from Sumatra in Tanzania. We've had quest, um, requests from Nepal and from Bangladesh to have copies of the curriculum. We've had um, a colleague note, any frameworks practiced in Tanzania or elsewhere will be great here in Nepal, so we can use them to lobby for policy. We've also had a comment coming through from colleagues in Bangladesh. We have over 1.77 million registered motorcycles, but absolutely no baseline to properly plan or ensure. So lots of calls for good planning and baseline and appreciation of the work that you're doing um, in Tanzania. Um, a so we'll make sure we'll make those copies of the um, Bona Bona curriculum available for everybody afterwards. Um, Elizabeth, a question for you that's coming from Nigeria, from Nasiru Mohammed um, Baba. He asked about sustainability. What happens to the transport vouchers um, after the project ends? If you could kindly share some thoughts on that. Uh, with regard to sustainability for the first uh, two projects, if the vouchers are donor funded, then when the funding ends, the voucher also ends. So in this case, the vouchers ended. But then we moved on to that project where we said we started working with the local people to see whether people would be interested in saving money and then they keep this money you know, within their group and they identify a transporter who can be able to take them and then the group pays. So we're not issuing vouchers, but in a sense there is an arrangement where a transporter would be able to take them. But uh, a group can also decide to have transport vouchers that are prepaid for by the community. So in, in terms of sustainability, that, that would be one of the suggestions that we would have, rather than having them um, entirely externally financed. Then the other is to have uh, maybe such, you know, vouchers that are externally financed for groups that are, you know, extremely unable to pay. You know, maybe they are too poor or they are disabled, then that comes in um, very handy if you're able to get some funding to help them. Yeah. Super, thank you very much. Um, and apologies with the connection um, to the Uganda hub. We are still linked up and they're hearing as well. Um, it's just on the audio connecting them up to speak the questions through. But we've got a question from um, Dr. Richard Abari from the North Star Alliance, um, the country manager in Uganda, who's saying, you talked of Boda Bodas being introduced in rural areas and underserved um, urban areas. But, and I, this is probably a good question for, for Leo, um, in Tanzania, how have you controlled this to avoid congestion in the cities? Um, yeah, uh, the regulation stipulated uh, very clearly that the, the, the authority has a mandate to fix the boundary whereby the border borders are not allowed to, to operate. So in the big cities, like in Jerusalem, 
We don't allow the bodabodas to park in the city center. And in the big areas like uh, Mwanza and uh, somewhere in there, whereby the transport activities are quite enough, uh, we don't allow bodabodas to operate in those boundaries. So it's controlled through the regulation. Thank you very much, Leo. Um, more requests coming in from um, Kenya for the curriculum, um, so we'll make sure that's also shared with you. That's noted um, from Boniface. Um, we have a question for Felix. Um, Felix, how long did the study in uh, Myanmar take? Uh, good question. So um, the study took about four uh, four weeks, um, but that was just a study time. We had to um, coordinate with local police, local traffic police, to find good streets where you could put up the camera. But uh, basically it was four weeks and uh, we traveled from observation site to observation site in every observation site. So we, we had eight, uh, we did two days. Um, so it's, it can be done really, really quickly. But this also means that since Myanmar has different seasons, one of them is a, a rainy season, which might change helmet use, we're not so sure. Um, so this means it's only a, uh, uh, well, uh, one-time uh, uh, study, so we, we want to do it more often to also see if helmet use changes throughout the year. Thank you, Felix. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, this could either be by a response from Felix or from Leo, but um, how does Tanzania or um, in Myanmar deal with the challenge of customers who don't trust sharing helmets? If either of you have any comments to make on that, um, maybe let's start, um, Felix, to see if you saw this issue. Um, this is something I uh, haven't looked into uh, too much, so I think uh, Leo might be uh, the perfect one to answer this question. Lovely, thank you. Over to you, Leo. Yeah. Hello. Uh, you asked about the wearing of the helmet. Oh, uh, can you repeat, please? Of course, of course. The question is, when passengers are sharing helmets, um, yes. is there any reluctance to do this or questions of trust coming up? Okay. Yeah, uh, we're trying to sort it out by preparing the disposable uh, caps. Uh, right now, there's some people who are making come up with the innovative that there is a sort of a slight caps that they can wear. Uh, they can wear before they put in the helmet on their heads. So hopefully in the near future, the change will help the, to, to induce uh, most of the passengers to wear helmet by covering their heads through uh, simple uh, caps. Great, thank you, Leo. Um, and a question coming in from um, a, an organization um, called Safe Fodder in Uganda. And they are asking, um, asking you, Leo, how in Tanzania you manage, they're saying that in Uganda, in Kampala, they have um, huge problems with um, infighting between different border border associations. So want to know if you employed any strategies to bring these groups together, or how did you, how did you go about it? Thank you. Yes, uh, we have a strategy. We are collaborating with the local government the local government is in Tanzania is very uh, vast and uh, it covers a wide area. So through the uh, local leaders in the community, we ensure that this uh, border border association be registered through these uh, local areas. And in our channels, we approach these local leaders to ensure that the information reach the associations. So we are we we, we really involve community leaders to ensure that the associations get stronger. Thank you very much, Leo. Okay, let's try handing over to our um, hub in Zambia, which is being facilitated today by um, Victor Simfukwe. So handing over to you, Victor, can you hear us? Victor is not on. Victor, mute from Leo. 
Thanks. Um, thank you, Leo. He's in the attendees. We've just um, unmuted him, but um, I've seen some questions have been posted from Zambia. Victor, can you hear us? Yes, um, uh, I can hear you very well, and uh, so is everybody uh, in the room. And uh, good afternoon, the moderator, and good afternoon, everybody who is uh, attending this uh, webinar. Uh, we do have uh, a few questions, and uh, which we've actually listed down. My only question is um, how many people are able to sort of raise? Otherwise, uh, we, have to open up here. We, can, um, we can type them. So how many can we can we ask at this point? <laughs> um, Victor, if you um, start with two, and we'll see how we go. Thank you. All right. Um, the the first one is uh, is um, uh, the first one that comes from Zambia is uh, um, there is a question uh, in asking from all the presenters that are uh, under which uh, private public sector uh, framework were these projects implemented? to ensure future sustainability and also mainstream them into government programs. So it's a, it's a question that is coming from GISP. And who would you like to direct that question to, Victor? It, um, I, I would like to direct that uh, to, to all the presenters, but anybody who is uh, quick to answer that question, maybe they will be more than happy to, to hear that uh, response. Um, Leo, would you like to take that one up first? Uh, I didn't catch it well. Okay, Victor, could you repeat the question, please? I, I can repeat that. Under what public uh, partnership were all these projects implemented to ensure sustainability so that they can be mainstreamed into government programs. Thank you very much. Yeah, and under the PPP uh, concepts, here we are using the, uh, the model of um, uh, the, the model that they are quite acceptable. Um, we as a government, we, we, we have the law, the regulations, and the ordinance, we purchase the, um, the the motorcycles and operate, and given that the local government owns the land, owns the stations, we build, we build the, the model of, uh, say, this parking shed, whereby the border border when they park there, they pay the rent. Uh, they, for instance, one taxi it pays one hundred in a day, so in a year they pay, let's say, about thirty six. Thousand. This money used to ensure that the government um, make that uh, making sure that the regulations and the education department it goes very smooth. So we find that the operators they operate very freely, and the government did their part to ensure that the services are, are, are met the standard of safe, and the community gets what they want. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that, Leo. Um, Victor, one, maybe we'll do one more question, and then we've got some colleagues with their hands up, so we'll try and go to them to hear their questions live from the live broadcast. So um, another question from the Zambia Hub, please. Everyone who's attending this webinar. Uh, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Absolutely, Elizabeth. Would you like him to make a contribution to that question? Uh, this is Fidelia from Zambia. Oh, thank you, Elia. Please, please do go forward with your question. Yes. Uh, um, following uh, Elizabeth's uh, presentation from Uganda and uh, our own experiences here in Zambia, of course, um, a transport for rural areas, the need cannot be overemphasized. Uh, but uh, my concern is uh, what is being done to improve the design of the border border 
so that it's more road safe for the rural women to use with less incidences of road traffic accidents. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Elizabeth, are you okay to respond? Yes. Um, from from uh, the experience we have here in Uganda, um, I can talk about the motorcycle ambulances, where there are models, where they are now putting the sidecar, such that if you have a woman, instead of you know sitting on, a, on just a motorcycle, she can sit a side, in a sidecar that is made you know more comfortable. She can be able to lie down, uh, propped up. She has a, a seat belt. It's also made with uh, shock absorbers, so that on bad roads, it's 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 more comfortable. So that has been the improvement that I've seen with regard to having you know, different varieties of motorcycle ambulances, but. For the border border itself, I'm not uh, aware if there are other models that are, you know, manufactured to be made a lot more more comfortable. Yeah, that's the contribution I'd make. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And um, there are organisations, um, manufacturers out there, such as um, E Ranger, who who build a motorcycle with a side cart um, that's designed for sort of off road. Um, rural transport to link up the referral chain. So we can again put more information um, on the website, on the landing page, and send that to interested parties. Um, okay, I've got um, a hand raised from the Global Helmet Initiative in Tanzania. So handing over to um, Alperio now. If you could um, say your name, where you're, um, a bit about you, where you're coming from, and thank you for your patience. Please fire away. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Eggy. Can you hear me? We can hear you well. Please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'm reporting here from uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where I am attending the fifth global meeting of NGOs advocating for road safety and road victims. As you are aware, more than 1.3 people are dying yearly, and more than 50 million injuries are happening on our roads. Now, coming to Tanzania, uh, as you are aware, we are having an area of uh, about 945.1 thousand square kilometer. It has a population of about uh, more than uh, 45 million people. And uh, we have a growth rate of 2.8% per annum. So you can see how uh, we develop the youth who are the major stakeholders uh, using the motorcycles. In the year 2013, we did our research, observation research on helmet wearing rate, and this uh, data are being used with the government of Tanzania to help Tanzania prison service uh, to build a helmet factory so as the availability of helmet can be cheap, can be affordable, and can be effective according to Tanzania Bureau of Standard and according to our Tanzanian laws and the regulation. Uh, in this research, we were uh, driven to make two things. One, to make sure that the Road Traffic Act of uh, number 168, which was revised in the year 2002, uh, mentioned that a passenger must wear a helmet because the current uh, is not mentioning, it's just mentioned a driver. And the number two, it was uh, with the purpose of harmonizing between the current existing law and uh, the uh, transport licensing regulation of 2010 of Sumatra, which requires both drivers and the passengers to wear helmets. So you can see here, the law mentioned only a driver, and uh, uh, Sumatra regulation mentioned both. So we did this so as to get from uh, down the users what they, they feel using these two things which are not harmonized. And uh, we come up, uh, just uh, roughly because of time, we come up with the following. We approach about 32,150 
uh, motorcycle users, the drivers and the passengers in Tanga, Morogoro, and the Dar es Salaam. Motorcycle drivers and the passengers are likely, when we were taking this into percentage, uh, they were likely, both of them, 53% uh, were likely to use helmets, only 53%. And uh, when we break down uh, of the data revealed, uh, we revealed some key uh, elements or factors uh, that drivers were likely than passengers to wear helmets by 7% versus 21% respectively. And also, males were three times more likely than females to wear a helmet. Uh, this is about 60% versus 20% uh, respectively. And then we come up with some questionnaire why uh, some people, all these uh, drivers or passengers, males and the females, they did not like to wear a helmet. And the, the reasons they gave up is like uh, helmets uh, uh, will make my hair not good, helmets are hot, uh, helmets, uh, you know, when I put it, it's like a taboo to my uh, body health. So they come up with some reasons, and that's why we say these uh, data were very helpful to do and they come back with our national policy. Because if you come back to the year 2003, we had a national transport policy and the rural development policy of 2003. Then, in the year 2007... Well, apologies, I am going to have to ask you just to wrap up. Um, it's really interesting and you're responding to a few questions raised, but just for time, another 60 seconds tops, please. Thank you. Thank you. So when you come up to the national road safety policy of 2007, and now we had a 2009 natural road, national road safety policy, which provides a set and national targets. That is where a gap we see there is a gap, and this gap we have addressed to the government of Dar es Salaam of Tanzania, so as it can work and to, to do it to finish, it, if not making zero uh, death and dangerous using the motorcycle. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the colleagues in this forum uh, a good day. Thank you ever so much. And, and we will be in touch later to get some more information and make it available in um, our reports, which we will share with all of the colleagues today. And thank you for taking the time from the conference as well. Um, a question, quick question for the Kenya Hub, um, sorry, from the Kenya Hub to Elizabeth. Did the frequency of the use of the Boda Boda by the women vary between the dry and rainy seasons. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, unfortunately, we didn't uh, notice particular attention to find out if there was um, a difference, but we, we didn't notice any particular differences. It's likely, but we don't have had information on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we're going to um, invite a question from another of our live broadcast colleagues. Um, so, um, Boniface from Kenya, we're going to unmute you to explain where you're coming from and pose your question. Thank you. Okay, Boniface, we're having a problem um, with the sound. Let me see if you've posted a question. Maybe I can read it out instead. Okay. Um, in the meantime, while we're trying to um, while we're trying to get um, Boniface's contribution. There's um, a couple of questions that have come in. Um, it's quite a delicate one, I suppose, but asking about, okay, I'll ask Elizabeth this one. How safe is it really for an expectant mother to use a boda boda? And I've had other people say, but what are the alternatives? So maybe you could just share your thoughts on that. Um, we would, in the, in the place where we worked, 
we did not have uh, many reports of accidents. You know, when we had focus group discussions and feedback from the community, there were no accidents reported. But that was probably because there is much less crowding in the rural area compared to urban areas like Kampala. So it was safe for them to use it. In terms of comfort, of course, it is not the most comfortable method. But in some cases, then the alternative would be that they walk maybe seven kilometers away or that they sit on a bicycle that is a lot much more uncomfortable. Then the, the improved version, of course, is, is the motorcycle ambulance where there is um, a seating provision where, which can be a little bit more, which can be more comfortable and allow them to uh, recline. So in, in the circumstances that we have in developing countries, still motorized ambulances would be the best, but again, we are not able to afford that. So it, it's better than walking or bicycles, but not as good as a, a vehicle, yeah. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, okay, so we move to the next stage of the, um, the webinar now, because we're having just under 10 minutes left. We've, had, we've heard from our speakers. We've had some great contributions and questions raised, so thank you for those. Um, now is the time. We, if we haven't got to your questions, we know there's a lot been posted. We're collecting them, and we're going to respond to you over email. So please don't be um, frustrated if we couldn't respond today. We will make sure that we get back to you. All the questions have been noted. Um, but now we'd like to invite people to make suggestions or recommendations for future research around the topic of motorcycle taxis. Um, so do we have any suggestions or contributions in this regard? Please feel free to post or to raise your hand if you'd like to make a contribution. Um, Abdul Razak, do you have a proposal? Um, Abdul Razak from Bello, um, Bello from Nigeria, from Adamawa. Do you have some proposals for future research that should be done that you'd like to share with the group? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Abdul Razak Bello, and I work for Translate as a consultant. Uh, I just want to make a little comment on the border. Now, Translate is a scheme in Nigeria, and this emergency transport scheme in actually helping transport pregnant women from rural communities this well facility in the rural area. Now there are so even even here we in Nigeria we some to transport the woman to transport the woman from one up with the vehicle. So I just want to ask Elizabeth uh, Elizabeth a question. Now if a woman is already in going to help her, that is one. It is for and uh, uh, I think that's all. That's all. That's all. Okay, thank you, Abdul Razak. If you could respond quickly, Elizabeth, and then we'll take more proposals for research. The topic we're on now. Thank you. Unfortunately, I didn't get the end of the question. I just heard if a woman is already in the health center. Okay, for, for time, um, we'll get Abdul Razak's question um, separately and respond and, and share that round because um, I'm also not sure I fully fully got it. We've got posted research suggestions. So, Boniface, sorry we couldn't get you um, verbally earlier, but thank you for posting. Customer experiences with Bora Bora riders um, as a piece of research. Great suggestion. We'll be sure to note this one down and share this with Recap um, to see if they might want to take some of these up. Um, a question coming in from um, Free Fernando, a disaggregation of motorcycle use and the incidence of accidents at different stages in the transport network 
also a really interesting suggestion. Um, we have another question, another proposal coming in from um, Shadrach um, Willio. Proposal for future research. Thorough cost-benefit analysis of border borders in urban versus rural and implications to national and community development. We have them. Um, um, there's so many flying in at the moment. Um, data improvement between police, hospitals, um, and Sumatra. Proposals to look at behavior change. What a better understanding of how accidents happen, such as focusing on black spots where the majority of accidents happen. There is much new research on accident avoidance, such as no surprise, no accidents. Could that be applied? And um, people are proposing links and suggestions. Um, okay, thank you so much for all of those suggestions. Um, we'll take one, um, we'll see if we can unmute Dr. Peters and, um, for a suggestion of future research before we draw to a close. Dr. Peters, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just to mention a uh, research, three-year research we're doing in northern Liberia on a project that is upgrading food parts uh, in a very rural area to uh, motorcycle motorcycle accessible tracks and um, I think it's new for Liberia it might be done in other places uh, in Africa but I think for a study it could be quite interesting to see what actually is the impact of if, of this very low cost kind of a way of um, of providing access to rural communities and I think one of the great things is that uh, contrary to kind of more traditional feeder road construction, a lot of the money that is needed for this uh, for this quite cheap kind of way of uh, uh, providing access to communities is staying within the community. So it uses community labor, it uses materials. So in the end, not only have communities much better motorized access, but they also have some money in their pockets to maybe set up businesses or uh, go into cash crop farming. Um, so for future research, um, this might be interesting for other groups to, to look into if there's something similar happening in their countries. I think in Asia it's quite common, these special tracks, but for Africa I think it's less common. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, for sharing the research you're doing, um, and we'll be sure to make some more of that available. I think a lot of our um, participants today would like to hear more. I'm afraid I will have to wrap up the webinar, as that's all we have time to. I'd like to say special thanks to our speakers, to Leo, to Felix, Elizabeth. Thank you to all our active participants today. We've had over 50 join us with the live broadcast and over 30 through our hubs. So we've reached at least 80 people today, probably closer to 90 when we get the final numbers in. I hope you found the discussion informative and stimulating. I particularly have enjoyed the breadth of the discussion for this introductory webinar to hear about safety issues, rural access and health all in one discussion. Again, I'd like to thank RECAP and UK Aid for making this possible. And if we have been unable to respond to your many questions, please email us, get in touch, and we will make sure we get back to you. If you want to watch the webinar again, we will be sharing the link with you. Finally, and very importantly, your feedback is very important to us. We will be sending you um, a questionnaire through um, GoToWebinar, which will just take you a couple of moments to complete. We would really appreciate if you could take the time to do that and send it back to us. In the hubs, please kindly fill in the evaluation form, um, and that's also a chance to make your contributions, pose your questions, and very importantly, propose your ideas for future research. There's some great ones coming through today. So I'd like to just say one last final thank you to you all, and wish you a very good rest of the day. Goodbye. <laughs>